All right, I see we have 16 people on now. We are expecting a few more, but we'll let the stragglers join in as they come. Um, so as an introduction, my name is Laura Allen. I'm the national organizer for Generation 180. Generation 180 is a nonprofit that is committed to accelerating a cultural shift in energy awareness and clean energy adoption in households and communities throughout the country. Each month, we bring you the experts um, with a live webinar that gives members an insider's view into the world of clean energy. Our guest speakers are thought leaders in their industries and join us to educate and inspire advocates of clean energy and the clean energy movement. Together, we will gain a deeper understanding of energy sources and find new perspectives on how they impact our daily lives. You can find links to the recordings of our previous webinars and register for the next webinar by visiting our website at generation180.org slash volunteer. And you can see that there on the slide. So before we begin, I'd like to share some exciting news. On September 5th, the New York Times published an excellent article on the efforts of schools to go green as a part of their Climate Forward newsletter series. And uh, both Generation 180's uh, co-authored report, Brighter Futures, and Matt, Matt Cassell's co-authored report on electric buses were featured in the article. Those are those reports. Um, and the New York Times did an excellent job of showing how solar panels and electric buses are a powerful double punch in the battle to get schools to go green. So it was just really excellent to have the New York Times recognize our work um, and the teamwork that we've done with SEIA um, and uh, Matt Cassell's amazing work with uh, his organization. And um, so without further ado, I'll go ahead and tell you a little bit about our speaker, Matt Cassell. Matt Cassell is USPIRG's Transportation Campaign Director. That stands for United States Public Interest Research Group. Matt works on transportation campaigns on both the national and state level, advocating for the development of a cleaner, safer, and more modern transportation system. Matt has authored reports on electric buses, how states can ma maximize the Volkswagen's settlement money, and about the need to shift transportation spending away from wasteful highway expansions. Now, for purposes of audio quality, the audience will be on mute during the presentation, but at any point you can type questions into the question box in your control panel, and they will be seen by the presenters. At the end of the presentation, I will select questions for Matt to answer. Matt Cassell, thanks for joining us today. I'm now gonna make you the presenter. Okay, thank you so much, Laura. Um, and it was really nice of the New York Times to see that we were doing this webinar and put both of our reports in um, to have a nice little plug in there at the beginning. Um, um, welcome everybody. Thanks so much for taking a little bit of time on your early evening or mid evening or late afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, as Laura said, my name is Matt Cassell and I am the Transportation Campaign Director at US PERG. Um, before I start, I'll just say briefly a little bit about US PERG. Um, we are advocates for the public interest, working to win concrete results on real problems that affect millions of lives. Um, and we stand up for the public against powerful interests when they push the other way. Um, we see the problems that we face, um, that they don't care if you're liberal or conservative, if you live in a red state or a blue state, um, they affect each and every one of us. And that's why for decades, we've taken a nonpartisan, fact-driven, results-oriented approach to our work. Um, so for, on this webinar, um, as you know, we'll be talking about electric school buses. Um, so at the end of the presentation, I'll hope, I hope, I'm hoping that you will, um, one, understand the health effects of diesel buses. Uh, two, I've learned about the state of the technology of electric school buses. Um, we'll talk about the economics of electric school buses and in, including lifetime cost savings and some potential funding and financing options. Um, and then finally, we'll end um, by briefly talking about the environmental impacts of transportation, um, and then especially as it relates to 
electric buses. Uh, so as Laura mentioned, I co-authored um, this report on electric buses. It came out last May, um, and I've included the link right there um, if you want to go download it, or feel free to email me and I'll send you a copy. Um, there's a lot of good resources in there and some more detailed information about a lot of the stuff we'll be talking about today. So I recommend you check it out. Okay, so as you can see, this is Harper. Harper is my daughter. Um, she's 13 months old. And I included these pictures partially because I'm a very proud dad and I take any chance I can um, to share photos. But uh, I also included them because Harper has made this whole issue a little bit more personal for me. Um, children are especially vulnerable to air pollution. Child asthma rates across the country are skyrocketing, about 8.3% nationwide, and even higher in urban areas like where Harper and I live in Boston. Um, and that's because of the way that we do things, including running diesel buses. Uh, as you can see from the middle picture, Harper's not only a pretty cool kid, but um, she likes to be outside, and she should. She's a, she's a kid. Um, I hate to think that we're putting her health in danger each time we take her outside or that she's breathing dirty air or particulate matter and that her little lungs are being put at risk. Um, and it's especially hard knowing that there are better options that we're not using as much as we should yet. So what does the school bus have to do with all of this? Um, well, as it turns out, a lot. Uh, we don't often think about it this way but school buses are the largest form of mass transit in the country. Uh, there are nearly 500,000 school buses on American roads carrying millions and millions of children. Um, but the majority of school buses remain dirty with 95% of them running on diesel. All right, I probably don't have to tell you that the black cloud behind that school bus is unhealthy, but I'm going to in a little bit of detail now. Um, air pollution from transportation is responsible for a staggering 30,000 premature deaths each year, um, mainly due to the health problems caused by that pollution, like respiratory diseases, heart disease, and cancer. Uh, some of the main pollutants emitted by diesel specifically include particulate matter, which is basically tiny little pieces of metal that we breathe into our lungs. Um, uh, and also nitrogen oxides, which contribute to smog and ground level ozone, um, hydrocarbons and carbon monoxide, uh, none of which are good for us. And as I mentioned, um, children are especially vulnerable. Uh, we know that there is no safe level of diesel exposure for children, uh, but as part of our research and in, in writing that report, we looked at air quality tests and we know that when kids are on the bus, boarding the bus in their neighborhoods or at a school around a running or idling bus, they are exposed to high levels of diesel exhaust. And here you can see some of the uh, main health risks associated with diesel pollution. Um, some studies have found that in, in places with high rates of diesel exposure, the mortality risk is higher. Um, there are increased cancer rates, and of course there are all sorts of respiratory concerns, including increased asthma. Um, and then, of course, diesel pollution also contributes to global warming, and there are a whole nother set of health effects associated with that, um, not to mention um, some of the, the other climate change effects we're seeing with stronger storms and more frequent storms and things. Luckily, um, as I think everybody on this webinar knows because they are on this webinar, um, but there is a better option, and, and that is the electric bus. Uh, maybe this isn't exactly true anymore, but for a while we had to say, we know that it seems like electric buses are something far off in the future and they'd be great if we had them, but they're not ready yet. Um, but that's not true anymore. I'm, I'm here to tell you that they're ready for the road, they're cleaner, they're healthier, and they're often cheaper to run in the long run. Um, so electric buses are, ready for the road. In fact, they're already on the road in several places, including um, Sacramento, California, um, some places in Massachusetts where I live, Minnesota, Quebec, Canada, and a few other places. Um, the, the Massachusetts and Minnesota school districts have pretty limited 
pilot programs, but California's fleet is now up to around 150 electric buses. Quebec is running 60 electric school buses. Um, so they really are uh, available and, and, and ready for the road. Um, you can see they have pretty good range and battery capacity. Um, these are just a few of the uh, electric bus models that, that are available, the Type C buses. Um, you can see the E-Lion um, with a 220 kilowatt hour battery pack can get up to 155 miles per charge, um, which is pretty good. Um, this can cover, so as part of our report, we, um, we took a look at American school bus routes. And these could cover about 80% of bus routes with just an overnight charge. And then with a midday charge, they could cover even more. Um, and in addition to these models that I have on the slide here, there are several others available for purchase already. And then both Thomas and IC have new models expected to come out next year. Um, once they do, I think at that point, um, every major manufacturer of American school buses will have an electric bus model. So they really are becoming more and more um, something that could be mainstream. So of course, electric buses need to be charged. Uh, from what we looked at, uh, on average, electric buses will take about six to eight hours to fully charge. Um, so an overnight charge would be perfect. But fast charging technology is becoming more prevalent and is certainly already available for some of um, the electric bus models out there. And I think will just become more and more prevalent um, uh, as the technology uh, improves. Um, there are also opportunities to implement contactless or in-street charging to make it more convenient. So if you know, you're not going back to the bus depot where you have your plug-in, there may be an in-street charger that the bus can sit over for a little while and get a half a charge and, and, and be able to do the afternoon route. Um, so closely managing charging is really important for school buses and, and, it, and is a great way to reduce operation costs. Um, I say that because um, the, the Massachusetts pilot program, um, the school districts, so the Vermont Energy Investment Corporation prepared a report sort of analyzing the pilot program and they found the school districts for a long time hadn't really managed charging well and we're seeing increased costs because of that. Um, but it is it is definitely possible and, and a really good idea to manage your charging. Um, so for example, the Twin Rivers School District outside of San Sacramento used a route planning application to determine exactly which buses to charge when to maximize efficiency. And they've really successfully figured out when each bus needs to be charged to meet the route and then when they can do it to save money. Electric buses also have far fewer parts than diesel buses um, and as a result require less maintenance. Uh, a 2016 report found that electric transit buses required maintenance once every 133,000 miles while natural gas buses needed to be serviced every 45,000 miles. Um, with fewer parts and no exhaust systems, fixes for electric buses are also often a lower lift than say replacing a, an engine or something like that. Um, and the electric powertrains in electric buses, this is something that comes up a lot as people worry that the buses aren't, aren't powerful enough to handle the hills or the routes, but actually the electric powertrains provide equivalent or better performance than the same category combustion engine vehicles. Um, and not to mention they're quieter, um, they're more pleasant to be around and drivers typically report that it's a, it's a much better experience to drive an electric bus than it is a diesel bus. Okay, so not only are electric buses out there and ready for the road, but they actually are cleaner and healthier. Um, no matter the electric grid, electric buses are more energy efficient than diesel, natural gas, or hybrid counterparts. That's true on coal power grids, um, although not as good as renewable um, uh, places that get their energy from renewable sources. Um, but it is still true. And it's also important to realize that only electric buses get cleaner as our electric grids get cleaner. 
And as a nation, we are moving towards cleaner energy. Um, I don't know if everybody saw, but just the other day, California adopted a bill to commit to 100% renewable energy for their electricity sector by 2045. Um, so you can see on the chart on the slide, the difference in mileage each type of bus can travel on an equivalent amount of energy. So basically the comparison here is based on one gallon of diesel. A diesel bus gets about four miles to the gallon. Um, the equivalent energy, obviously an electric bus isn't using diesel, but the equivalent um, energy usage for an electric bus would get 17 miles, which is um, a really significant difference. Uh, and then, of course, with zero tailpipe emissions, electric buses significantly reduce exposure to the localized pollutants that cause all of the health problems that we talked a little bit about earlier. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about electric bus economics because that's really always the big question. Um, I don't think it's any secret that electric buses cost more upfront than diesel buses do. But the lifetime costs of electric buses are actually lower than their diesel counterparts, um, thanks to the lower maintenance and fuel costs, uh, which we will talk a little bit more about. Um, you can see on this chart, which is from our report, um, that averaging things out, uh, we estimated that by year 12, the lower costs make up for the difference in purchase price. And, and from then on, the bus is actually saving money. So typically school buses, including most electric buses, are on the road for 15 to 16 years. Um, I actually heard someone today put it really nicely. A, a kid could get on a brand new electric bus in kindergarten and hop off as a senior in high school, uh, which, is, which is a pretty cool thought. Um, so you can see our chart estimates the total lifetime savings of an electric bus will be $31,000, and that's, that's per bus. Um, and that's not insignificant, but I, I do think that this is a bit of a conservative um, estimate based on where the market is going. Um, some models may seem, see some increased savings. Um, school districts with good partnerships with their utilities may see increased savings. And um, as electric bus prices come down, of course, you will again see increased savings. Um, so the reason electric buses save money over time is because they have lower operating costs than diesel buses. Um, so we talked a little bit about the maintenance, um, but it also costs less to charge a bus than it costs to fuel a bus. Um, and it also helps that electric buses provide more predictability in yearly costs because electricity prices are more stable than fuel prices. And you can see um, on this chart, this is transit buses, but the estimated lifetime costs of a diesel transit bus is over $700,000, while an electric bus is less than $300,000. Um, you can also increase your savings by linking a, a, your electric bus to the grid for greater benefits. Um, so there are a couple of ways that this can help. Um, so electric buses, of course, are powered by taking energy from the electricity grid. Um, when they're plugged in, their batteries charge and buses use that stored energy to travel on their routes. Um, so by managing when the vehicles are charging, electric buses can help support the electric grid by charging at off-peak times. Um, you can partner, a lot of places will partner with their utility companies to set up pricing incentives for off charge, uh, off peak charging. Um, so basically you'll be charging your bus when demand is low and you'll get a, you'll get a better rate for that. Um, new technology uh, called vehicle to grid technology can also allow buses to send stored energy back to the grid. When, it, when equipped with vehicle to grid technology, um, electric buses basically use their batteries for energy storage, uh, which provides a service to the grid by reserving it and selling it back at times of high demand. Uh, this is really valuable for school buses, which when you think about it, typically charge overnight when electricity demand is lower and are parked during the middle of the day and the evening when demand is highest. And then they're often not 
in use or in less use during the summer when air conditioning use is at its peak. Um, just how valuable this can be is, is still a little bit in development, but a 2014 analysis from the research from researchers at the University of Delaware estimated that a school bus could generate more than $15,000 from selling energy back to the grid. And a couple of early pilot projects with electric school buses in um, a few school districts in California found that um, with the vehicle to grid technology, they were generating more than $6,000 a year by sending extra electricity back to the grid uh, during periods of high demand. Okay, I hope um, all that information is helpful, um, but I know that the purchase price can still be a hurdle. Um, so I put together here a small list of some examples of additional funding opportunities that we'll talk about, um, but also you can look to our report for more information. And um, we're actually currently working on a new report that'll go into some more detail. So you can also look for that in the coming months. Um, so first, there are some federal grant programs that can be taken advantage of, including the EPA's school bus rebate program. program. Um, this program allows the EB, EPA to offer rebates uh, in addition to some grants to reduce harmful emissions from older, dirtier diesel vehicles. So if you're retiring an old diesel vehicle and replacing it with an electric bus, um, you can either get a rebate or a grant to help you cover that purchase price. Uh, many states also have grant or incentive programs that help with the purchase price of electric buses. California has several, um, many through the California Air Resource Board. Uh, Alt Fuels Colorado is one in Colorado that can help with the purchase of electric buses. Um, and a lot of states have air quality management districts that um, are trying to improve the air quality in the districts and will help with incentives or some funding um, to uh, replace diesel buses with uh, zero emissions electric buses. Uh, some cities also have programs that can help with funding. For example, Chicago's Drive Clean program um, uh, spent $10 million on electric buses. Uh, and then as we've talked a little bit about, um, partnering with utilities is a great way to either secure incentives or in some cases actually help with funding. Um, the Sacramento Municipal Utility District actually committed a million dollars to support upgrading charging equipment for electric school buses. Uh, many manufacturers have financing or leasing programs, um, including battery leasing, which can help alleviate some of the costs. Um, but finally, I wanna talk about one of the, the most significant and immediate opportunities, which comes from the Volkswagen settlement. Um, Volkswagen marketed some diesel passenger diesel uh, vehicles as clean diesel, uh, claiming that they reduced emissions. When the cars went through emissions testing, the tests showed that that was true, but that's because VW had installed software called a defeat device um, that produced legal results when being tested, but when the cars were actually on the road, they were emitting far above legal limits. Uh, this was discovered by a team of researchers at West Virginia University and the US Department of Justice sued Volkswagen, um, and the company entered into a settlement with the DOJ which included uh, nearly $3 billion for something called the Environmental Mitigation Trust Fund. That money from the trust fund is being doled out to every state in the country based on the number of offending cars sold in the state. So states are now in the process of determining how they will spend the money. The money is specifically designated to reduce emissions from transportation and particularly from diesel. But there are a number of different ways that states are allowed to spend it. One of those ways is to help with the purchase of electric school buses. Uh, some states have already gone through the process and determined how they're going to spend the money. Um, a few of those states have decided to spend it on electric school buses, New York being a, a great example. Um, but some other states are still in the process. So this is a really great opportunity to, if you're a school district, to either apply for some of that money for to help fund an electric school bus or start your electric school bus program, 
or if you're in a state that hasn't yet decided how they're going to spend the money, to lobby your governor and environmental and transportation departments to dedicate the money to electric school buses. Um, so as Laura mentioned at the beginning, um, I co-authored a report um, that US PERG released last year with a lot more information on this settlement. Um, for a link to that report, you can go to usperg.org or just shoot me an email and I'll send you a copy. I think it, it is um, worth also saying that even without any of these grant or incentive programs, although we should be taking advantage of them as much as possible, um, even without them, we should still be making the switch as fast as, fast as possible, uh, given the, the significant health and environmental benefits of switching away from diesel to electric buses. Um, and it, it, it doesn't hurt that um, there is some beneficial financial um, uh, incentives as well. Um, so I included just a, a couple of other potential options for financing the switch, um, which work differently in different places. So I don't want to get too into them, but um, municipal bonds or ballot initiatives often can be used to make big capital purchases um, like the purchase of new buses. Um, so a brief case study of how one school district that I've mentioned a couple of times now um, made a really great electric bus purchase, and that's Twin Rivers Unified School District, um, which services three large Sacramento suburbs in California. Um, the school district has been championing electric buses for more than a decade. They're really early adopters, um, and they're currently operating 16 electric school buses across their district. Uh, but they've paid, they've actually paid very little out of pocket for those buses. So they've taken advantage of state programs from the California Air Resource Resources Board um, and the California Energy Commission, as well as a program with their local air quality district. And they are also the school district who has worked very closely with their utility, uh, the Sacramento Municipal Utilities District, to get good charging rates and also that $1 million utility investment in charging. Okay, so I want to um, finish up by talking a little bit about the relationship between transportation and global warming. Um, transportation now produces more greenhouse gas emissions than any other sector in the US, uh, and it's the only sector that's share keeps getting larger. Um, in some parts of the country, like Massachusetts, where I live, it accounts for 40% of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, global warming is arguably the largest challenge facing not only our country, but the entire world in the coming decades. And we really need to act now. Um, and, and we can't effectively fight global warming without totally transforming our transportation system. So there's a lot that we need to do. For one, um, we need to facilitate a movement away from a car-centric transportation system and boost investment in our public transportation and our walking and biking infrastructure. Um, getting people out of their cars and walking and biking or riding public transit is, is the best way to reduce transportation emissions. But electrifying transportation is also a huge part of the solution. Um, if we replaced every diesel school bus in America with an electric bus today, we would avoid 5.3 million tons of greenhouse gas emissions every year. Um, you can see on the slide, that's the, the carbon dioxide equivalent of 572,292 homes energy use for one year, or uh, the, the product of 1,342 wind turbines running for, uh, for a year. Um, those are pretty significant numbers. Um, fighting climate change is obviously a really big battle, but electrifying school buses is a great and really important step. And it's one that is, it, the public health outcomes are just so significant that it's really something that, you know, is taking off for those reasons, but, but you know, we are, are working to find ways to make sure that it can take off even faster. Um, so that's my presentation. Thanks for your attention. I, I hope that this has been helpful. Um, I have all my contact information here, so please don't hesitate to, to reach out, but I think that now there may be some questions. 
Thank you for taking the time to um, share your incredible knowledge about electric school buses with us. And um, so we can also take questions. Folks, if you'd like to type your questions into the little video box over there. Um, under questions, you can type that in, um, hit enter, and um, I can read your questions out. Um, so one of the things that folks are interested in is the source of electricity. Now, of course, this is where solar schools comes in, which is um, what is near and dear to the hearts of Generation 180. Um, and can you just imagine if there were solar panels on all of the schools that had electric buses, and those schools didn't have to waste their valuable resources buying diesel gas for those buses, and all of that energy just came from the sun and was part of the energy that the school itself, the structure of the school was producing. And what, an what a wonderful example that would uh, provide to the students. Um, I love that idea. So, yeah. And, I, yeah, and I don't know about you, but I've definitely, you know, been in the carpool traffic near a school, <laughs> breathing that terrible, dirty air and just thinking about those little kids there and wondering how, it, how is it that we're still allowing this to occur? Um, we have the technology. Um, so yeah, thank absolutely. you. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So thank you for addressing that. Um, and also, Harper's adorable. <laughs> How old is thank she now? Thank you. She's 13 months. Aww. Yes. <laughs> so she'll be on her own school bus in no time at all. Hopefully an electric school bus. That's... <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yes. Um, so <laughs> for our own schools or for your school, how would you go about introducing this? Yeah, that's a great question. So I, I think that part of um, or a really important first step is engaging sort of all of the stakeholders and engaging the parents right away. Um, starting with the research of the health benefits, but then also the available buses is, is good. But, um, you know, you can have all the information you want. And if you don't have buy-in from the people who, you know, are actually, who actually matter here, and a lot of that is the families and then, you know, your town council and the, the school board and all of them. But when you get buy-in from the families, that's when it's going to really start to move. Yeah. So I would suggest, you know, starting the public outreach very early in the process. And that's what Generation 180 is here to help folks do. So for people who are interested in um, gathering momentum in, in their school districts to do clean energy uh, technology implementations like this one, um, we're here to help support you, so please reach out. Um, and uh, once again, my name is Laura Allen. I'm the uh, national organizer for Generation 180. And uh, you, our uh, email address is available there. Mine is laura, L-A-U-R-A, at generation180.org. Please feel free to send us your questions. And we will be following up with a video of this amazing slide deck. Thank you again, Matt. Um, so that folks can uh, watch this. And Matt, are you wanting to provide the slides or is that something um, that's gonna be available? Yeah, sure, yeah, I can make them available. Wonderful. Yeah. Great, yeah. So, um, and we'll make sure that those are available for folks to access in the future. Okay, um, and let's see here. So you did mention that uh, Volkswagen settlement money. How do folks get access to that? Yeah, so the way the Volkswagen settlement money is is working is there's there's a trustee that all the money came to, and then the trustee is taking state plans from what they call beneficiary agencies. And basically, for the most part, those are your environmental protection agency or um, your state environmental agency. So um, the state environmental agency comes up with a plan, submits it to the trustee, and then the trustee releases the money to the state environmental agency. So here in Massachusetts, that's the Department of Environmental Protection. Um, the Department of Environmental Protection put together a plan and they said, you know, we want to purchase, so our plan actually is purchasing some new electric transit buses. So um, the transit agencies can then apply to the Department of Environmental Protection for the money to purchase the buses. Um, so really, if you're looking to get money to purchase a bus, 
um, you would be going through your beneficiary agency, which are all listed, um, I think, on the website that I gave you. But if they're not, I have them all. So just shoot me an email and I'll let you know. Um, but each agency will have their own sort of application process. But for the most part, it is a competitive application process. So you'll put together your proposal for some new buses um, with all of the, you know, all the benefits that it would bring your community. And then hopefully you get some of that money. So that's something that individuals can do themselves. So yeah, like if a school district or however a school district goes about funding their buses, whether it's it's through the city or the school district itself, would then go and work with their their uh, state's environmental um, department or their beneficiary um, to to figure out the exact application process. Okay. Well, hopefully it's straightforward and quick. I don't know about quick, um, although it is moving faster than it did at the beginning. So I think the money is going to like the money is really going to start getting to um, the places. So there were a few hiccups at the beginning, but now the plans are really moving. And I think money is actually going to be getting out there and some new buses are going to be on the road soon. So we're just in time then. Yeah, perfect timing. That's great. Wonderful. Um, did anybody else have any questions? I'd like to give folks an opportunity to type any questions in that they might have. Um, here we have a question about um, the life cycle cost of the batteries and the disposal and recycling options. Can you speak to that a bit, Matt? Yeah, so um, for the most part, we've seen that the, the batteries are lasting for the lives of the buses, although that is, a piece of technology that's sort of um, still coming. I mean, these these buses are still fairly new, so most of them haven't lived out their their lifetimes yet. Um, so it's the potential for an extra cost of a battery if a battery has to be replaced is there. Um, but we haven't seen that from you know looking at the buses that are on the road now to be an enormous problem um and there are also options for um um leasing options and and things like that to help mitigate some of those issues uh mm -hmm. as far as the disposal and the uh recycling um that's not something that i actually have have done a whole lot of digging into um i you know, I would imagine that the um, um, the manufacturers would have some good resources on that. Um, but if whoever asked me that question wants to send me an email, I can um, I can certainly look into that a little bit more and get you uh, get you at least some resource, point you in the way of some resources, if not a, a good answer. Great, we'd love to know here as well. Okay, great. Ali will let you know. Excellent. Um, and then we also have a couple of questions on. How does the charging infrastructure work in terms of recharging the buses? Yeah, so um, there are you know there are different ways to do it. For the most part, there'll be plug-in chargers, um, and so the suggestion would be to have your plug-in charging infrastructure where you park the buses overnight. Um, and there are different types of chargers. There are you know we call them slow chargers, but there's the normal chargers and those are the ones that would take the six to eight hours. There are also options for fast chargers, um, which the purchase price would be a little bit more expensive, but you get a lot faster of a charge. Um, How fast is fast? So, uh, so that, that's a good question. I, you know, for um, a full charge on a fast charger for an electric bus would probably be well, I don't want to say because I don't I I don't actually know that exact answer, but um, yeah, I would I would look that up, but I I would think that it would be more like two hours for a full charge. That would be great. So that could occur during the school day, possibly. Exactly. Um, yeah. So that you could have the full rotation, you know, to get all the kids, um, even in more distant locations, mm -hmm. delivered safely home. Exactly. That would be. Um, yeah. And then, as I mentioned, you also have options for in-street or contactless chargers that you could put in places other than where you park um, the buses overnight for if you need an additional charge. That's fascinating. Is that by magnets? How do they do that? Yeah. So um, actually, this is 
cool because in, in Martha's, <laughs> of all places, in Martha's Vineyard, um, they have a number of electric transit buses and they're putting in these um, in-street chargers and they basically look like, um, like sewer lids. Um, but they're just a little charger and yeah, and then, and then it's just a, through ma I, it's, there's no plug. It's just through contactless charging. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah. And I thought it was cool that my cell phone could do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that is cool. That. Bus. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Great. Well, uh, thank you so much for all of that really valuable information. Again, if anyone has any other questions, we can take them here. Um, otherwise, I think we'll go ahead and wrap up. Matt, did you have anything else that you wanted to add? Um, no, I think I talked for a, a good amount of time there. I would just say, uh, just one more time, emphasize that, um, you know, the, the public health and especially the health of our children, um, mm -hmm. the benefits of these buses are just so profound. Um, and the technology has really come a long way and it's here and the more we use them, the better it's going to be, the better we're going to know about charging and how to work them in with the grid. Um, and really the time is now to make this switch. Um, and it's just, we're going to have such a better world once we do. That's so true. Well, thank you so much for your valuable work on this, Matt. We really do appreciate it. Thank you. All right. And thank you to everyone who joined us today. I know you all have very busy lives and finding even an hour on a weekday is always challenging, but we're very grateful that you decided to spend it with us and learning about electric buses and how we can advance the clean energy movement in our own communities. So stay safe out there and I hope everyone um, weathers the storms well and um, you know takes care of one another. And we hope to see you next time. You can register for our next webinar online at generation180.org volunteer. It'll be another one next month. Thanks everybody.